Hi everyone, this is Will Florsheim, and uh, this is my lesson on the Salem Witchcraft Trials. I'm calling it Scholarly Arguments on Trial because at the end of the lesson, as a uh, culminating activity, students will be evaluating uh, ac arguments actually made by uh, the historians we considered in the course as graduate students. Here are the learning goals established for our lesson, including particularly starting off with some context. Uh, we're going to ask students to delve into how Puritan religious and social values, as well as attitudes of New Englanders towards both Indian tribes and warfare, as well as their understanding of witchcraft, uh, all predating the Salem events, possibly shaped the events of 1692. In addition, we're going to consider arguments made by historians and some of the uh, factual information that might underscore some of their arguments about uh, changing ways of life and economic systems, as well as some of that pervasive warfare among Indian tribes. Lastly, we're going to ask students to uh, evaluate historical arguments and engage in their own process of historical inquiry. In my classroom, we start every lesson with a bell ringer, some teachers call it. I call it a day starter. Um, students will start with this activity. Uh, for our two-day lesson on day number one, watch a short video clip. Um, it's kind of a humorous, very stereotypical portrayal of a uh, Puritan roommate someone might have in college. And students will be challenged to basically identify those stereotypes, and then that'll lead into a broader conversation about kind of the accuracy of some stereotypes we have in popular culture versus what's actually historically accurate about Puritan society and religious beliefs. Following our day starter, the largest chunk of uh, the first day of this lesson will have students kind of delving into some context that would help them understand what happened in Salem possibly and what was going on there before the witch trials ever happened that even made the trials possible. Um, so students will work, I have my classroom divided in three rows, and, and we often will do kind of a jigsaw type activity uh, where students will obtain different readings, primary sources, secondary sources, what have you, and, and work together to come to a conclusion about different interpretations. Today's, um, we'll have kids reading some different primary sources about different aspects of what was going on in New England and, and Salem. Uh, in particular, there's three questions that will be answered, one by each different reading group. Uh, the first group will focus, as you can see, on, on Puritan religious and social values, the role of the family within uh, Puritan communities. Um, students will kind of challenge that narrative of where did that idea of a city on a hill originally come from. The second group will look at witchcraft accusations, uh, how common were they, where did they arise from in society? What types of people were accused? What did the accusers often say was happening to them as a result of accusations? Uh, and then the third group will focus on conflict with Native Americans that had happened before Salem had ever taken place, um, looking at accounts, in particular Mary Rowlandson's is a famous one, um, about just kind of the, the trauma that extended from conflict with uh, Indian tribes. Ultimately, after students have had time to work in their groups and come to conclusions regarding these questions, they'll have spokespeople they'll pick that will share their responses uh, with the large group and we'll, we'll have just a kind of a brief conversation so that we get some understanding across all three of these areas as a large group in class. After we've considered primary sources together uh, for some context, We'll go into a direct instruction uh, phase of this lesson. Uh, I'm not a big lecturer as a teacher, but kind of the necessary evil sometimes is conveying some simple information to students in a, in a you know, fast, straightforward way. So uh, when I do give information like this, I have students take Cornell notes where they kind of just write down the most important information they see, and then at the end of the information they've transcribed, they'll kind of come up with a summary of, okay, so from what Mr. Florsheim shared with us, what really matters? What's the most important information to take away from, you know, whatever few minutes of information I provide them? So starting here, King Philip's War um, would be something I would introduce them to. Uh, in particular, I want them to understand when it happened in context that 
Salem happened in 1692. So some of these conflicts that maybe had an impact, like King Philip's War, happening 10 or 15 years before Salem events really ever started to unravel. And especially at the end of this, I want them to see the long-term consequences of the war, that yes, there were a lot of people killed on both sides, but it really raised tensions, and the tensions were were raised to a point where they really weren't going to come back to people coalescing and peacefully coexisting. Um, in addition, it, it kind of allowed for the spread of English colonies in southern New England, but yet students need to understand that didn't take care of other parts of New England that are going to be more a part of the Salem story later. I've included a map of King Philip's War for students. I want them to particularly note where the tribal areas were and then where the settlements were, the smaller dots here, and just to note the kind of the nature of this unavoidable coexistence that, that developed for both colonists and for the Indian tribes and how that would have been present on all their minds. Basically, there was nowhere to run. They were basically in each other's backyards all the time. In addition to King Philip's War earlier, students also need to understand what was happening in King William's War, which happens to coincide with the events of Salem in 1692. King William's War goes from 1689 to 1697 um, and arguably had much more direct impact on the events of Salem. Um, you can see under the long-term consequences here. M many historians have argued that uh, including Mary Beth Norton, who is one of the works students will consider at the end of the lesson, um, argue that the events of King William's War impact, and the impact of it actually uh, helped to spark some of the craziness that was going on in, in Salem. Um, in particular, I want students to un from, understand from this that this conflict, interesting, it actually was something that had spilled over from uh, Europe and conflicts between Protestants and Catholics in Europe, it's a good opportunity for me to share with students here that oftentimes in the historical record you'll see where the English and the, and the colonies were equally as scared of the French as they were the Indians. Some of the things they said about the French were equally as negative or seeing the French as, as satanic in many um, places as they did the Indians. And that had to do with the conflict that existed between Protestant and Catholic ideologies before there was settlement really by Europeans in the New World. The other lasting thing for students to take away kind of as an enduring understanding um, is the long-term consequence down here that yes, they did even settle these wars eventually. You know, after the Salem events were already over and the warfare kind of turned down in King William's War, they started developing treaties, this Treaty of Ryswick here, but this conflict was ongoing and it'll help establish some eventual further lessons in early American history for students about kind of that, that nature of just because one war went away, it didn't make Indians go away, it didn't make conflict with Native Americans go away, and it certainly set up kind of this nature of treaties that were developed with Indian tribes falling through the cracks. Here's a map of the conflicts in King William's War, and kind of like with King Philip's War before, I want students to see on the map the, the uh, import of geography here, and if you look at the area where a lot of the Indian raids were taking place, you can see it's happening on the frontier. It's not where, if you look down where Salem was by Boston in here, um, it's not there. It's, it's up in this frontier area of Maine, but you can see kind of how the residents that would have been there would have felt trapped by geography. You've got rivers, you've got kind of some mountainous areas up in here, and you've also got, as you look further to the north and further out to the west, you've got people surrounded on all sides. So you get this understanding of how people would have really felt trapped with, with no relief. After our discussion of uh, both King Philip's and King William's War, what I really want students to take away from those two events as they relate to Salem is, is this information, that really there was some frustration on the part of both sides, um, in particular colonists who couldn't convert the natives to Christianity. Um, you had conflicts with these kind of these persisting raids by the Indians who were upset about land deals and distrust. Um, with the colonists, um, and these raids just turned frequently more violent, and they left a, a tremendous amount of trauma on the part of people that had been living in these frontier areas, then oftentimes for their own safety, were forced to flee 
of which Salem was a place of prime example. So to wrap up our lesson for day number one, um, I'm going to ask students to, based on what they understand about some of the context for what was going on in Salem um, and the Indian Wars in particular, talk about the nature of PTSD. There's a really short video clip here um, from a veteran, uh, this guy Ed, Ed Fair, um, talking about his experience with PTSD. And it'll let kids maybe see an angle into the Indian warfare um, that will help them understand maybe how some of these girls in Salem would have responded having seen what they did on the frontier. To start day number two of our lesson, um, I'm kind of taking a shot in the dark here, um, but I'm thinking this is going to work for what I want. Uh, I'm going to have students compare their ideas of town kids and country kids or city kids and country kids. Um, as a way to introduce them to some of the factionalism that was going on between Salem Village, um, a smaller agricultural area, and Salem Town, uh, a larger kind of more urban area uh, in 1692. After our day starter for day number two, I'm going to ask kids to look at um, some data related to differences between Salem Village and Salem Town uh, in the second day's lesson. And this particular chart shows um, tax amounts paid by the wealthiest 10% of taxpayers in Salem Village. And I'm just going to ask students to work amongst themselves and, and turn and talk to a partner about what they notice in the data um, and kind of the support for the minister in the town. And they'll notice a clear trend here, hopefully, that a lot of the people at the top of the list that were paying the most taxes were opposed to the town's minister whereas you don't really see people that were in support of the minister on this list. A second activity that we'll have students do will be to look at this map, uh, which demonstrates where the accused and the accusers of witches lived uh, between Salem Village and Salem Town in 1692. And it kind of shows, hopefully students will see, that um, the accused were far more likely to live closer to the town, which was um, more commercial than the more agricultural, um, kind of more economically maligned, supposedly, Salem Village. Working from their understanding developed in the last two activities, I'll share just some very brief background information for students uh, on the difference between Salem Town and Salem Village. Uh, and I'm going to really focus on this information on the right here about Salem Village, that the village was without some of the functions you would expect uh, local government to have, even today that our towns would have. Um, the ability to collect taxes, the ability to uh, kind of administer their own activities, and, and the town continued to make demands of these people um, to pay taxes to them and to even engage in activities like the night watch against Indian raids in the town, but yet the town provided no avenues for the village to do that for themselves. I'm also including for students here uh, two maps taken much later in 1985, uh, just to, for some context, to show them what Salem town, uh, modern Salem, kind of looked like at that time. And you can see the harbor here and just the very large developed town that over time that's what had happened. You look at Danvers, which was Salem Village at the time, and you can still see kind of out here in the far reaches of the northwest. There was a lot of land even in 1985 across centuries of development that wasn't arable, it wasn't good for farming, kind of like the argument was made by people living in Salem Village way back in 1692. So at long last we're finally going to get into the witch trials themselves and I'm going to have students uh, get an introduction to the trials with this short video clip. As they watch this clip they'll fill out this very simple reflection form which is something they would be familiar with using. Following the video clip, I'll provide just this one slide worth of basically background that historians have agreed upon regarding the trials. In particular, I want to point out for students the role played by young girls, um, kind of that social ano anomaly that was present there, and then just the number of people ultimately involved in the trials uh, at the bottom of the slide here. As a culminating summative activity, students will uh, be challenged to take two historical arguments and answer these questions. Why did Salem society react the way it did? And then who or what was most responsible? They'll consider excerpts from Mary Beth Norton as well as Paul Boyer and Stephen Nissenbaum. And as they do, they'll complete this worksheet uh, recording their thoughts. Thanks, everyone.